programs. And as you plug in to myself, to Ashish and Dr. Cesar Molina, various ways that you can take this effort to your doctors to partner with the center's efforts in living a better life, for that is a life well lived. With that, let me pass it over to Ashish and to Dr. Molina. Thank you. Thank you, Satish. Thank you for uh, the introduction and thank you for the expression, uh, you know, about your life and how this has impacted you. Um, it, was, it was very poignant to kind of hear your story. And indeed, um, you know, the, the start of the South Asian Heart Center was because of the stories of uh, people, you know, like your dad um, that we started seeing at El Camino Health, which is a community-based hospital uh, here in um, Mountain View, California. So um, I'd like to kind of just present the South Asian Art Center to you quickly and then move on to um, Dr. Molina, who is uh, also a co-founder of the South Asian Art Center and the medical director to talk to you about what we have built and why we have done that and what are some of the results that we kind of see. Uh, but more importantly, what is the science behind what we do to make this um, epidemic of heart disease and diabetes within our reach uh, to change, within our reach to make a difference. Uh, so with that, thank you Satish for the opportunity. And I'd like to share my screen so we can start that presentation. Just a second. All right. So the South Asian Heart Center, as you might know, I'm sorry, this, ah, here we go. Uh, our topic today was an introduction to the South Asian Heart Center, but indeed uh, the question that we have um, for everyone is, uh, is, is this a lifetime of on meds or a lifestyle of meds? And a play of words, uh, because we've built a very powerful lifestyle uh, platform called MEDS as well that we'll introduce today to all of you. So if you look at uh, South Asia or countries of the Indian subcontinent, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Nepal have a disparate global burden of coronary artery disease and diabetes. 60% of the global burden of coronary artery disease 50% of the global burden of diabetes. And, um, and that's just not um, that, but it's happening to a lot of us um, at much younger ages. 25% of the heart attacks before the age of 40, 50% before the age of 55. Um, and in this country, the average age for the first heart attack in men is 65 years. Um, and women 70 years. So it's 50, 10 to 15 years earlier or ahead of the population. Many of you already know this because it's happening uh, within your families. And then not only that, but it um, affects us differently. Besides the two to four times the incidence, the rate of mortality is really high with coronary artery disease as well twice the rate. So if you look at um, the traditional guidelines that have been there so far, underestimate the risk in this population. It is really um, that we do not have a good solution for this problem. The South Asian Heart Center was created in 2006 with the mission to reduce the high incidence of diabetes and heart attacks with culturally tailored, science-based and lifestyle-focused services. And indeed, even till today, there isn't a program like this um, you know, in the United States for sure. A lot of lifestyle-based programs, uh, but they are different in terms of how they are structured and what they are 
um, wanting to achieve. So the first thing was that we opened the center as a nonprofit organization at El Camino Health, which is a community-based hospital. And now we have developed a proven personalized prevention program that has enrolled over 9,000 people um, in, in counting. We were literally the first of its kind when we started in 2006. And a lot of programs kind of exist today, but most of them are really either research oriented or clinically oriented. So no different from doctor's offices. Um, and there are a bunch of those. And the most notable ones are the research program called the Masala Study at UCSF. Uh, there is um, one initiative at the um, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Uh, and um, and, and programs locally here at um, Sutter Health in Stanford. Um, but most recently in, in, in 2018, we were finally recognized for our work by the American Heart Association. And in 2019, we got recognition from the Centers of Disease Control um, as well. And now these two organizations have indicated the, that you know we are kind of a model program for prevention of these um, twin epidemics in, in South Asians. Um, we have built a very um, strong team of a scientific committee that consists of all the players from many of these organizations that I have shown you, uh, from Stanford, from UCSF, uh, people who have written about this particular issue, you may know of Dr. Sinha, uh, Kaiser, et cetera. Uh, and then our team has been around literally all of us for the longest time now, uh, looking at this particular issue uh, to serve the community. The result has been that we now have a virtually deployed prevention program in 38 of the United States, participants from six countries, and now a growing corporate program base as well, including one running at our own uh, hospital, uh, which has been quite successful. So the enabling platform that we have built, and this is what you're going to hear more about today is called MEDS, which is designed to facilitate and maintain homeostasis, balance or good health. Uh, and when we are looking at this balance, we're looking at metabolic health. And the four aspects of this platform are MEDMS, very simple. Uh, but what we have done is that we have packaged, um, you know, the education and the coaching material with this platform that makes it easy for individuals to actually incorporate um, this in their lives. And on top of this platform, we have now built four services that address different um, issues and different demographics um, as well, but all aimed at reducing the incidence of heart disease and diabetes. Our flagship product is called Aim to Prevent. Um, a for assess, I for intervene, M for manage. And in this, it's a very, very comprehensive look at um, your risk profile with a series of assessments, an intervention that consists of meds and a management that is done through a personal health coach. Um, and this is a year long program that people embark on with us um, as they find that they can actually reduce the risk and be well uh, with a lifestyle-based approach. Some of the results that we have seen are that people are um, exercising more. 63% uh, are eating more vegetables compared to when they joined the program. And the resulting clinical markers also see the improvement in triglyceride levels and cholesterol ratios. And if you look at event-free survival, which is people um, tracked over a period of time, uh, we have a 98.7% uh, survival rate um, from an event standpoint. Uh, so this is, as we have looked at over 4,000 participants who have gone through the program. 
if we look at stop the oral diabetes program, um, we see a lot of people losing weight, uh, but also more importantly, people improving their A1Cs um, as well. So with that, I want to turn it over to Dr. Molina, who is our medical director. He's a cardiologist with uh, El Camino Health and has been practicing uh, for a long time in this area. Uh, he has um, been educated at Yale for his medical degree. Um, he finished his thesis at Harvard and has done his residency and fellowship at Stanford. Dr. Molina also brings together um, a lot of um, experience with the culture. And that is really, really important as we were building up this program. Uh, he has been a practitioner of um, transcendental meditation for a very long time, as well as, you know, very familiar with the Bhagavad Gita uh, and the teachings of the Vedas. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Kulina. Thank you, Achich. Um, I will share my screen now. Um, I hope you can see this. So um, when I was listening to Achish um, talk, uh, I think that um, one of the things that is really important for everybody to recognize is that the South Asian Heart Center is really an educational organization. Um, and that the, the reason why I bring this up from the start is that or educational systems, either in this country and in most countries of the world, uh, teach us how to make change at McDonald's, but they don't teach us how to actually achieve a well-balanced life, uh, how to achieve you know, well-balanced physiology and how to be strong and fit. And how to, you know, can we actually then live to sort of uh, have a successful life story that is actually left out. Um, and we are trying to fill in um, uh, those deficits, in this case with the uh, South Asian, you know, South Asian Heart Center uh, meds or aim to prevent uh, program. So what we are talking about here is actually science-based. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is actually not fake news. I'm going to show you literature uh, that have been uh, peer reviewed uh, going back to 1953, which was the first time that science demonstrated that exercise was in fact good for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. Now to develop a system, a curriculum, uh, uh, educational curriculum for the South Asian Heart Center, we actually um, uh, went back and um, looked at the um, Sorry about that, it's just my, my mouse is really, really, really happy here. Um, we looked at a paper that was published in 1980. This paper actually followed 20, for 25 years, 7,000 uh, individuals in, um, in Oakland, California. And they identified seven factors associated with successful living, successful aging with longevity. And they define successful living or longevity as first to be alive, second, to be self-sufficient and autonomous, to be able to take care of yourself, to do your own shopping and to live independently in your home. If you, if you think about it, disease is actually the thing that actually robs our freedom, it robs our independence. All of a sudden we end up depending on someone or a system for our well-being, and we lose our independence and freedom and autonomy. So what are those seven factors? Well, adequate sleep, seven to eight hours per night, regular vigorous physical activity, seven uh, calories per kilogram per day of physical activity, maintaining a recommended weight, not being obese, not smoking, non or moderate alcohol consumption, in this case, moderate alcohol consumption could be up to five drinks a day, like, you know, uh, you know, like a six pack minus one beer. Uh, eating breakfast daily and eating meals regularly, not snacking. I mean, grandma was correct about uh, breakfast and not snacking. For a 45 year old person who actually had three or fewer of these uh, habits, 
that person in 1980 was expected to live to the age of 67. Um, by the, if they had four to five of these seven habits, uh, expected to live to the age of 73, and six to seven expected to live to the age of 78. And if you do the subtraction, there's an 11 year difference that can be played with uh, in, uh, in, in, as you're looking at longevity. The fact is that in this study was 11 years, but many other studies have come up with 12 years. So you can actually subtract or add 12 years to your life expectancy, depending on how you live. If you were to remove all cancer from uh, society, you would expect to, the, the average American would expect to live three more years. Uh, the same is true for coronary artery disease. So here, you know, the effect of living well is very, very pronounced as compared to other uh, modalities of treating disease. Now, the, I'm showing you some data from uh, European, from a German study. And this is actually a prospective trial where uh, they look at a, at a town called uh, Postam, and they actually identified four healthy factors that were associated with a total 78% reduction in chronic disease. Those factors were normal weight, no smoking, physical activity, and having a plant-rich diet. You don't have to be vegetarian, but having a plant-rich uh, diet. So the prevention of diabetes, if you had four of these factors, uh, was 93%. For coronary artery disease, in this case, a heart attack, the reduction was 81%, stroke 50%, and cancer 36%. Um, this is actually from Germany. Dr. Molina? Yeah. I cannot see any slides from you. I don't know if anybody else is having that problem. I'm sharing my screen. Okay. I can see the slides. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. I got them. Thank you. All right. Um, so let me go back again here. I, uh, as I move the mouse around. So this is a trial that was actually done in the USA. So there are three main trial, one Swedish trial, one German trial, and this is actually a prospective American trial called the ARIC trial. In this, uh, in this case, they also found four lifestyle factors, which were the consumption of fruits and vegetables daily, regular physical activity, having a BMI below or base BMI below 29.9 and not smoking. In America, unfortunately, 8.5% of the citizenship, this was actually 16,000 people who were supposed to represent the American population. Um, Actually, you know, only 8.5% of the population can meet these four criteria. Um, if after, if you were to convert, if you were to take people who actually did not have those four healthy habits and you converted them to the four healthy habits, this is what happened. And they were able to convert about 8.4% or 970 other subjects. But they found that there was a 40% reduction in all cause mortality and a 35% relative a reduction in cardiovascular disease over a four year period. Um, that's better than I can do by giving you a statin or actually doing an angioplasty. The effects were very impressive. And the interesting thing here is that in this trial, there was a 79% reduction in the incidence of coronary artery attacks or heart attacks. So we actually have seen 81% in the German study 78% in a Swedish study, and in this case, a 79% reduction. So you more or less can say that about 20% of cardiovascular disease will happen independent of lifestyle, but 80% is actually very much related to the life, the, the way we live. Now, um, I'm actually a, trained as an interventional cardiologist, and I developed this MEDS algorithm way before the South Asian Heart Center, when I was practicing medicine uh, and I would have patients show up in the ER with a heart attack, following their heart attack, I would tell them that I wanted them to learn how to meditate, exercise, eat well, 
and sleep. Um, the M also started for taking medications. Uh, and that's sort of the way I have been communicating with my patients since I arrived at El Camino Hospital uh, 30 years ago. But in this case, um, the M stands for meditation. We don't prescribe medications at the South Asian Heart Center. We let the physicians uh, do so. Now I'm going to sort of show you the science behind this. But before that, we're going to sort of define stress. You know, people use the word stress very loosely. And most of the time, you know, uh, we actually do not know really what we're talking about. We just know that when we are stressed, we don't feel well. It is uncomfortable. But we actually have defined, and this is actually unique for the South Asian Heart Center. Um, we have defined stress two ways. One as physiologic and the other one as psychosocial. And physiologic stress, which many times is unconscious, results from the inability of the physiology to maintain balance, to maintain a steady state, or to maintain homeostasis. Um, intelligence or know-how when an individual or organization is challenged. That is, if you're presented with a problem and you know the answer, you actually, it's not a problem. So people have talked many times about good stress and bad stress. No, all stress is bad. Now we can talk about challenge. And you know, most of us actually enjoy a challenge and we find it joyful to solve a problem or a challenge. Now the word stress came from, uh, was originated by a Canadian physiologist by the name of Hans Dodge. And he's the guy who actually defined the flight flight response, which in, uh, in the flight flight response, what happens uh, to, the, um, to the individual is that the frontal cortex, which explains why humans actually do not have to out, uh, outrun the tiger, but have outsmarted the tiger, um, gets shut off when we are under stress. So he said that stress is that which obstructs the flow of intelligence, because actually that part, the executor, the part where the judgment lies, the frontal cortex many times is sort of turn off when we are under stress. Now, let's look at the physiologic response uh, uh, to stress. We're challenged, we're driving down the street, we're passing through a green light, someone runs a red light and we are, act, we are asked to act. And you can see that we actually do response. We get out of a steady state we then respond in the red and then we return down to baseline and that is the normal response. We, the, the, the system gets activated, it actually, there's activity, but then things go back to steady state. In the blue, what happens is you have a prolonged response. Um, you actually um, are still living this response of someone running a red light and almost uh, uh, hurting you. And finally, in the green or the teal color down below, you see the individual who's unable to respond and therefore gets run over uh, by the other car. We see this in the intensive care unit when individuals come in and they have pneumonia or sepsis and they cannot muster a significant response and then they succumb to their disease. So this is a little cartoon, uh, sort of demonstrating what we mean by this. That is when the system is unable to return to steady state, when the system is not a steady state, it is not at ease. This system then is disease, not at ease. This is what the word disease means. It's not being at ease. Now let's talk a little bit about how stress affects our health. You know, we are actually very much aware of respiratory uh, viral infections these days. We have been locked at home because of it. And unfortunately, uh, we are now again seeing our hospitals full to capacity, um, forcing us to stay home because the healthcare system cannot care for us if we fall ill. Um, and this is actually the response of two groups. Uh, one group, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the non-hatch line, which is a group that is under significant psychosocial stress. 
And this is actually on the left, the symptom score of someone who has been infected um, with influenza A. And they have, as you can see, higher, more symptoms than someone who is in a low psychosocial stress group. On the right side, you actually are, we're looking at the measurement of the weight of the tissues, that is the secretions from individuals with high and low psychosocial stress. And what you can see is that individuals with high psychosocial stress put out more phlegm, more respiratory secretions than those in the low psychosocial stress group. This is very telling and it actually uh, does sort of demonstrates, you know, why individuals who actually are vaccinated do not respond to the vaccine. And only about 60% of people who are exposed to the influenza vaccine muster a fourfold higher immune response to the virus because there's 40% of those who actually are not able to muster their response. Now, this little uh, cartoon here sort of shows you what we're talking about. And if you want to actually think about, you know, uh, Ayurveda and if you're talking about Vedic language, you know, we talk about the three gunas, Risha Devata Chandras, and they actually are what is causing activity, what is really responsible for the ever-changing aspect of relative existence. Um, and if you actually quiet the three gunas, then in chapter two, verse 47 of the Gita, you get the technique to transcend, to be established in the self, to actually be still. And this is actually what happens. We're continuously during meditation, um, before meditation, we're continuously moving. And then as a result, we actually are each maintaining this homeostasis. But when we transcend, we actually uh, make it to the state of just uh, restful alertness. Uh, in this state of restful alertness, this is actually was published in the American Journal of Physiology in 1971. The physiology of the state was described in 36 subjects of practitioners of transcendental meditation. And what they looked was at oxygen consumption, which is a measurement of metabolic rate or movement. They looked at CO2 production, which is looking at respiratory quotient. Um, and then they compared this metabolic rate with sleep on the right side and with, uh, um, uh, with hypnosis here. So you can see with the practice of transcendental meditation, there's a 16% reduction over a 20 minute period in oxygen consumption or metabolic rate. That is compared to about an eight to 10% change after about five and a half hours of sleep demonstrating that during the practice of transcending, there is a significant drop in activity where there are moments where the physiology just stops for a second and you achieve this state of restful alertness or steady state or stable, you know, a state of being in the self, uh, free of the three gunas, free of activity. Now, how does this work? This is actually, in this case of uh, transcendental meditation, and there are many techniques that are described in the Gita and in Vedic literature. This is actually a technique that was chosen because it's widely available. It is extremely easy to do, does not require any religious understanding. It's actually, is a technique. It's not an issue of content. It's not an issue of emotion. It's just a practice of a technique. It's, it's like doing a push-up. You know, there's no meaning to a push-up. There is a benefit to doing push-ups, just like eating broccoli. There's no meaning to eating broccoli. There's a benefit to eating broccoli. So in this case, a sound or mantra is provided. And this sound has been shown to provide the mind with pleasure at finer level. So the mind will refine this sound because the refinement of this sound is associated with greater pleasure to the mind. And the natural tendency of the mind is to go to pleasure. To the point where there is no longer any sound, there's no longer any activity, there is just pure consciousness. So if you're conscious of the sound and the sound and the 
process of experiencing of the sound gets refined, there comes a point where there is no process, no sound, just pure consciousness. So this is a state known as a state of pure consciousness or a state of pure being, or also known as a state of Atma. Now, how, what happens to respirations when this happens? So here on the right panel, you can see that the subjects are breathing and these are just uh, breathing uh, spindles. They start practicing the uh, transcendental meditation technique and with transcending, there is no respiration. When they come back, they come out of trans that transcendental state or restful alertness, um, they come back and start breathing again. But you see, they were not holding their breath. It's just metabolism has ceased and therefore they continue to breathe at a very slow pace, expressing the decreased uh, metabolic rate. Uh, the subjects are not holding their breath. They're just spontaneously dropping their uh, metabolic rate and respiratory uh, rate. At that point, there is a point of perfect stillness uh, and or balanced state. Uh, this is actually contrary to disease. This is when the system is perfectly and only then is perfectly at ease. So what are actually the consequences of this? So if the system is not working like this, but just very much closer to the mean, what you know Aristotle would call the golden mean, um, they can actually then maintain that state easier in an, easy, in an easier fashion. So once you, uh, you get to a balanced homeostatic state, that tends to, tends to self-maintain itself. So here you have two groups. You have a group of tra transcendental meditator, uh, meditation practitioners in the blue and in the red control subjects. And what happens is they're giving a noxious auditory stimuli. And the skin response is a way of assessing the response of that individual. When you're presented with a noxious stimuli, you actually have increased sweat, therefore decreased galvanic skin resistance, which is a measurement of activation or anxiety. When you're having an interview, your palm gets a little sweaty. And you can see that the practitioners of TM after 15 stimuli stop responding. They turn it off. They maintain a steady state. While the control groups continue to respond and it takes about two, uh, two times more stimuli to habituate them to no response. In the right, you can see this, how uh, it's sort of modeled. And this is the modeling response of the meditators uh, compared to the non-meditators. Now, when you look at biologic age, and biologic age is measured here by blood pressure, HDL cholesterol, visual acuity, and auditory acuity, long-term practitioners of transcendental meditation uh, tend to be about 12 years younger than the control subject. The these long-term meditators are considered to be meditators have been uh, practicing between six to eight years as compared to a control group. There seems to be a 12 year difference between their chronologic age and their biologic age as determined by what I mentioned to you, which is a common way of determining a subject's uh, um, a biologic age. Now, I'm just presenting this here. I'm not going to go over all the data. I'm presenting this data here so that if you actually have access to the PowerPoint, you can then actually look at the health benefits that have been published in, uh, in peer reviewed uh, journals. The one that I want to bring your attention to because after all, this is a South Asian Heart Center when trying to prevent or participants from getting a heart attack is that in a study that was performed in 250 subjects with coronary artery disease as compared to control groups, practitioners of transcendental meditation had a 47% reduction of death, heart attack, or stroke within a five-year period. And these were just intention to treat. Those people, those subjects who were doing it at least once daily experienced a 61% reduction 
in um, death, MI, uh, or, uh, or stroke. So it's pretty impressive. Now we move on to exercise. And um, in this case, we recommend regular, varied, and vigorous uh, physical activity 30 minutes a day for at least five times a day, five times a week. Now, this is what I tell my patients. I tell my patients that if you are not fasting, that is, if you're eating, you should make a point to do some kind of program, plan, physical activity. Uh, we should not just go on like five days, you know, uh, at least six days a week should be, uh, sh you should be involved in uh, vigorous uh, physical activity. Um, I'm asked many times about being, you know, the weekend warrior, meaning exercising just on Saturday and Sundays. That tends to be a benefit in people who don't have any significant cardiovascular risk factors. But individuals with significant cardiovascular risk factors like hypertension, coronary artery disease, diabetes, they tend to have worse outcomes than individuals who are not weakened warriors. Now, this slide is presented here to demonstrate the benefits of fitness. So this is actually a, this is actually a paper published in 2008. It's a, a paper from Japan where they took subjects and they exercise them on a Bruce Protocol treadmill and they separate them as to achievement of certain metabolic uh, units of work. 10 metabolic units is actually that you can increase your metabolism tenfold with exercise. F less than five metabolic units is that you can actually minimally uh, increase your physical um, activity, you're not fit. And they follow them over 12, 20 years. And you can see the survival uh, that individuals who actually um, exercise at baseline for more than 10 metabolic units, about 78% of them were alive 20 years later, as compared to individuals who exercise less than five metabolic units, 40% or about 38, 35% of them were alive 20 years later. So again, showing the amazing effect of fitness. And this has actually been demonstrated multiple times. This is another study. It, this is actually from, from Texas. Um, this is actually from the Cooper Clinic in Texas, looking at 10,000 men and 3,000 women with an eight year follow up and looking at the level of fitness the, um, with the purple color being the fittest individuals versus the um, uh, red uh, uh, color being the individuals with the least uh, fitness. And you can see that there's a significant uh, reduction over an eight year period, both in men and in women in uh, immortality rate uh, as compared to uh, fitness. In fact, you know, we go to the doctor's office and we get multiple labs for your blood sugar, your cholesterol, your liver, your kidney function. But the most important predictor of longevity and successful living is fitness. And that you have to get as exercise stress test, you know, to determine that. Now, uh, what happens, oops, what happens if you are unfit and then you become fit? And this is actually another study by the same group, um, uh, by Blair. And they actually did uh, exercise stress tests five years apart. Um, and they separated their, uh, their, their uh, uh, this is a men's study, nine, uh, almost 10,000 men uh, in three groups. Individuals who were unfit on baseline and unfit five years later. Individuals who were fit at both testing and individuals who were unfit and then became fit. And you can see that on those individuals who were initially unfit, but subsequently became fit on a Bruce Protocol treadmill test, their mortality rate went down by half. Obviously the lowest uh, uh, mortality rate were individuals who were actually fit on both tests. Uh, so again, demonstrating that fitness is um, very important. This is from a paper in 1995. It has been again shown a study that was produced from the Palo Alto VA hospital, looking at different, different diagnoses and individuals with cancer, 
coronary artery disease, hypertension, emphysema. Those who were fittest lived the longest. And the fitness was the most important determinant of longevity rather than the disease that they were diagnosed with. Now, the next question is, well, what is more important, um, being fit or, or slender or skinny? Recognizing that your body mass index and that obesity is the most important risk factor for bad things happening, happening to you. But in this study, you can see that in the orange, these were individuals who were fit and they had the least cardiac if, uh, events at any weight if they were fit as compared to those who were unfit. So even if you are overweight, you can see that if you are fit, you decrease, you, you decrease your, uh, uh, rel your relative risk by more than 100%. Um, so when asked the question, the fact is that many people have very difficult time losing weight. Your brain is set to this weight, but it is easier to get fit than to lose weight. So then the attention is placed at exercise and the attention is placed to fitness. Now, I, I thought that this was a very important slide to show because we're all affected by time. You know, and you know, that's a commodity that we never get back. Uh, and therefore, so what happens? What is the effect of time if we are depending on our level of fitness? And this is actually a slide showing runners and, uh, uh, and untrained individuals. See what happens to their VO2 max, their capacity to maintain their level of fitness. So you are fit if you actually can exercise over 10 metabolic units and you're in the best fitness group if you can exercise to 30 metabolic units. So if you are a high intensity runner at the age of 70, you will actually remain very fit. If you are a runner at a reduced intensity, like you know, someone like me, for example, you just I ask my, you know, I ask friends, please do not walk next to me because I'm a very slow runner. I attribute my running to my shoes, actually. But you actually remain fit at the age of 70. You are not going to be using a walker at the age of 78 or a wheelchair at the age of 80. You'll be on your two feet, self-sufficient, autonomous, and having a good time. However, if you were actually a runner and you stop training, or if you were on train, you will quickly become unfit. Um, actually, in your 50s, you will start seeing the effects of unfitness at the age of 50 to the point where you actually will be in trouble as you get to your, uh, to your the so-called golden years. Uh, and you know, you'll, be, you'll be able to go on a cruise uh, and they'll get you out you know, on a walker here and there. Uh, but you know, that's actually, um, that's what happens. So again, I want to really cement this, you know, fitness is important, exercise is important. Then lastly, we not only have to be alive, but we also, you know, we need to have our marbles but know where they are. And dementia is a problem 20% of 80-year-old uh, 80 plus individuals suffer from dementia. And we are living to the age of 80 now. Uh, the typical medic, uh, social security recipient at the age of 66 actually is expected to live to the age of 82. Um, and, um, and therefore, you, you, know, you, are, you know, you are at risk. Uh, but this is a study in which they compared three minutes and three times of aerobic exercise per week versus less than three times uh, per week. And you can see that after five years, these are individuals at the age of 65, after five years, uh, there was a 38% uh, lower incidence uh, of dementia. Uh, so uh, it, all the games that you can buy on PBS and blah, 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 to sort of prevent dementia, do not prevent dementia. Uh, doing puzzles, getting a PhD from MIT does not prevent dementia, but aerobic exercise uh, does, uh, does prevent uh, uh, dementia. 
Now, this is actually, we're summing up the health, the, the health benefits of exercise. I'm actually not going to go in details, but hopefully you'll be able to sort of peruse this literature uh, on your own time. Now, finally, um, just before we talk about sleep, we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about diet or nutrition. And the take home message here is actually very, very simple. Um, you know, many nutritional recommendations uh, talk about cups, they talk about servings. Well, most of us humans do not walk around with a cup, a measuring cup, uh, nor do we walk around with a tablespoon, but we do actually walk around, most of us, with at least one fist. So the way we look at it, and the South Asian Heart Center, we have come up with the recommendation that actually two fists of vegetables actually make up four servings of vegetables. One fist of fruit makes up two servings of fruit and then 12 nuts daily. And th there are two no's uh, in the South Asian Heart Center curriculum. The first no is not smoking. Second no is avoidance of sugary, artificially or uh, non-artificially uh, sweetened drinks anything that has the name soda behind it. And that could also be diet soda. And I will show you, hopefully we'll show you some of that data. Now, because we're the South Asian Heart Center, we can actually talk about Ayurveda. And in Ayurveda, different from uh, the allopathic medicine that I am trained in, we can actually talk about the digestive capacity. We can talk about acne. We can talk about metabolism and different individuals have different capacity of digestion. Um, and that has to be taken into consideration. So the take home message here is that we talk about not only what's on the plate, the dinner, we also talk about the diner. Um, and um, this is actually where most of the attention is. The attention is who is sitting in front of the plate. Um, and in, to take that into consideration, we know that there are genetic predispositions on how you metabolize uh, a fat and carbohydrates. And if necessary, you can actually have an assessment of your APOE isoforms. We also understand from the first part of the, call, the talk and the curriculum from the Elamida study that the number of meals is important and that breakfast is important. And that also the grouping of foods Mm -hmm. uh, tend to be important. So the reality is that the, the bottom line is that allopathic medicine has discovered using science, the wisdom of Ayurveda. And Ayurveda, we actually mix different food groups. We satisfy all the senses, but in allopathic medicine, we know that if we actually take vinegar in a salad and we then combine it with a glucose load as in white bread or French bread in a nice French restaurant, you will actually see a blunting of the glycemic response by the vinegar uh, in your salad. So from uh, um, Shushruta Samhita, the recommendation is to eat at regular times as much as possible. Our bodies, including our digestive systems, thrive on routine you'll be surprised on how good you feel by simply adopting this practice. Irregularity of diet brings about ill health. It brings about what in Ayurveda will be considered ama. Please realize that Chushruta is actually considered the father uh, of surgery. Now, this is actually, I'm going to take a break because I'm at home and I bake my own bread and actually the thing is beeping and I think may be disturbing some of you. So I'll be, I'll be right back, okay? I will actually provide you with my recipe to, any, to anyone who wants. Uh, I'd be happy to share my recipe on how to make, how to make amazing bread at home uh, in the COVID era. But anyhow, bottom line is here. 
Don't skip breakfast. It's associated with a 450% increased risk of obesity. Eating out is also associated with obesity. Uh, and the combination of foods is really, uh, is really uh, important. You can actually modulate the glycemic response. That glycemic response is more important in predicting cardiovascular disease that is in, uh, that your cholesterol. Now, I, I don't want to let this go. And that is, if you're physically active, you would actually also reduce your glycemic response. If you consume six grams of omega-3 fatty acids, fish oils, and you exercise as compared to um, canola oil uh, or corn oil, you actually enhance your muscle mass by two grams, two kilograms. So you can actually, if you are on a muscle building program, you can actually enhance your muscle building exercise program by the addition uh, uh, of omega-3s in your diet. So um, what's the story about, you know, uh, plant food? Um, and many times we get the impression that we are not supposed to eat certain foods. Um, but the problem here is it's not what we eat. It is actually what we don't eat that is really the most important factor, unless you're driving through McDonald's, okay? That, I mean, if you drive through a restaurant to get your food, we're talking about something else. But in normal kind of human feeding, it is not what you eat, but it's what you do not eat. And what you don't eat is uh, vegetables, fruits, nuts, and fiber. If you actually have three or more servings of fruits or vegetables per day versus less than one serving per day, you actually have a 24% reduction in heart disease mortality, a 27% reduction in stroke mortality. Um, and um, you actually, the highest fiber intake versus the lowest fiber intake, there's a 60% reduction in diabetes just by the amount of fiber, your, your amount of fiber in your diet. And you don't need to do anything crazy. You don't need to buy a book. You just have to have two fists of vegetables. People ask me about protein. Well, protein consumption is only an issue if you're having grains and seeds. But if you're having a full vegetable, not an issue. Because when you're eating a seed, the seed has genetic material and fuel and the zygote in that genetic material uses this fuel to make the proteins to become a tree. But when you're eating it, you're just not getting the science from the zygote, you're just having the calories from the fuel. So you may not be consuming a full protein when you're eating a rice or a dal. So you combine them. But the problem is when you combine them and you have the so-called full protein, you have a full carbohydrate load and you're having most of your calories in the form of simple carbohydrates. But when you're eating broccoli, when you're eating spinach, when you're eating a fully truly functioning vegetable that is performing photosynthesis, that vegetable has full sets of proteins because it's doing full set of life promoting work. And the consumption of protein is not an issue. You don't get, you do not get protein deficient. You can get all your nutrients except for vitamin B12 from a vegetable rich uh, diet. Now, uh, this is one of my favorite slides because, you know, we always talk about do not do this so that you don't get diabetes. But this is actually a slide showing what to eat so that you don't get diabetes. And here, if you have three servings per week, a serving is half a cup or half a fist, that would be a fist and a half of blueberries per week, you reduce your risk of diabetes by 26%. And you have an amazing breakfast or you know, snack. Um, 
If you have grades for races, you, you reduce it by 12%. Fruits, 11%. Apples, 7%. Now, unfortunately, the stone fruits that we sort of consume in, this, in the early summer are not associated with a reduction of diabetes. Now, if you have fruit juice, like if you drink a glass of orange juice every morning because you happen to see the TV commercials um, that you know selling orange juice are being healthy, which is not healthy food, you increase your risk of diabetes by 8%. So the game plan here is do not drink your calories. How about brown rice versus white rice? Well, if you actually consume white rice, you, uh, you increase your risk of diabetes by 16%. If you consume rice, but you replace that white rice by brown rice, you decrease your risk of diabetes by 11%. If you get rid of rice and you add another grain, you decrease your risk of diabetes by 36%. So highly recommended. I mean, replace your rice with quinoa, uh, uh, with sorghum, uh, with barley. Now, if you are a physician and you participate in the physician's health study and you had breakfast every morning and your breakfast cereal, you looked at it and you could see where it came from. That is, it looked like an oat rather than a rice crispy or God knows a cornflake that you cannot recognize it coming from corn, you decrease your incidence of heart failure between 29 and 33% just by eating well, by just being able to recognize the food on your plate. The consumption of nuts is associated with about a 30% um, a reduction in the onset of cardiovascular disease. So this is actually a paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at Mediterranean diet. And they took their subjects and they gave them 30 grams, 30 grams of California walnuts per day. And five years later, they saw a 30% reduction in the incidence of stroke and cardiovascular disease. That same group, another arm of the group, they provided them with two extra tablespoons of virgin olive oil per day. And there was a 40% reduction in the onset of diabetes over a four to eight year, five to eight year period. And that's very impressive just by the addition of olive oil uh, to, um, to your diet. If you consume one serving of dark, oily fish, you decrease your risk of macular degeneration by 48%. So fish consumption and cardiovascular disease is controversial, but there's no controversy on the health benefits of omega-3s on ocular health. And this is actually, this is an epidemiologic study demonstrating a 48% reduction in macular degeneration, which is the most common cause of blindness in America in the elderly. Now, finally, here are soft drinks. Soft drinks, one serving, one cola a day is associated with a twofold increased risk of diabetes, even if it is diet soda. Now, finally, we'll talk about sleep. And, you know, I, I think that in today's America with Netflix, the iPhone, the iPad, uh, with you know demand entertainment, uh, we actually have significantly cut down the the amount of sleep uh, uh, we experience, and that trend you know that started in 1975 with actually the uh, the onset of color television and uh, Johnny Carson at midnight, and in 2010 the typical BMI was 23. BMI is a measurement of obesity. By 1975, the typical American weighed 25.2 BMI. And by 2005, the, the, the BMI was 27. And you can look down below, the amount of sleep has sort of been going down. As we sleep less, we get fatter. Why? Because we spend, we're, we're more, we spend more time awake, so we have more time to eat. And also our metabolism, our society center is affected by sleep deprivation. 
Now, sleep deprivation, which was mentioned in the first slide from the Alameda trial, that the sweet spot was seven to eight hours in that study. You can see that the onset of diabetes, if you sleep more than eight hours, goes up threefold. If you sleep less than five hours or five hours, it goes twofold. So diabetes actually increases if you sleep too much or you don't sleep enough. And you know, those who are you know, readers of the Gita, uh, Lord Krishna tells Arjuna, yoga is for he who does not sleep or who sleeps too much. He who does not eat or eats too much. So again, this issue of moderation and the moderation here in sleep is seven uh, to eight hours. So again, it's sort of interesting, you know, allopathic medicine, regular science medicine continues to discover the wisdom of, uh, of Ayurveda. This is actually looking at uh, sleep duration and coronary artery disease. I, the first two slides were on diabetes. This is on coronary artery disease. If you sleep more than nine hours, you have a 38% increased risk of cardiac events. If you slept five or less hours, and you have a 45% increased risk of coronary artery disease. And women are particularly sensitive uh, to sleep deprivation uh, with hypertension and coronary artery disease. Um, and um, this is actually another trial showing the same. And this, there have been multiple studies, again, demonstrating the sweet spot and demonstrating here the sweet spot of seven to eight hours. Um, so this is actually, uh, this, is, this is our curriculum. This is actually the education that we failed to get uh, in high school. Uh, 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 and in junior high school. Uh, the education uh, that with, if incorporated into an easy, simplified, regular routine, we can actually maximize um, our cognitive capacity. Uh, I didn't show you a slide, but children who actually are the most fit tend to score the best in standardized scores in math and in languages. Um, and if you actually incorporate this very simply with physical activity, seven to eight hours of sleep, two feasts of vegetable, one feast of fruit, 12 nuts daily, um, and meditate, you know, you know, meditate, rest, you know, practicing restful alertness twice, um, uh, twice a day, very easy. And ultimately what happens is you do less and accomplish more. So I'd be happy to take, um, uh, any questions? Um, and, um, and between Achish and I, we hope um, we can uh, answer them for you. So please go ahead and, um, you know, you can chat your questions if you want to um, talk, uh, just raise your hand or unmute yourself and, um, you know, ask questions at this point. I wanted to cover two things, uh, Dr. Molina, uh, for everybody here. Uh, we wanted to talk about the change in the BMI guideline for South Asians. So would you like to talk yes. about that a little bit? Yes. So this is not only for South Asians, but it applies to all Asians. So, you know, the most important factor that controls our metabolism, you think about our metabolism as a furnace, think about our metabolism as acne, uh, think of it as a fire. Um, a way of producing energy. Um, the factor that um, predicts uh, or the quality of our metabolism, the most important factor is our weight uh, or body mass index or weight in relationship to our height. Um, we see significant metabolic derangements um, in whites and African uh, and actually blacks uh, in anywhere in, in, you know, both in the USA or in Africa. So, um, when the BMI goes over 25. And in fact, there's a linear relationship from a BMI of 19 all the way up for heart disease, stroke, uh, and hypertension and diabetes. But we start seeing significant metabolic derangements at a BMI of 25 in whites and blacks. In Asians, and that could be Japanese Asians, Chinese Asians, or South Asians, uh, South Asians are people from the Indian subcontinent, you start seeing metabolic derangements at a BMI of 23. 
So the normal BMI for a South Asian is less than 23. And what happens is really, you know, it's sort of interesting because, you know, you may be the, the skinniest guy in your group of friends because everybody else is so big and so fat, but you may actually have a metabolic derangement uh, at, at a lower BMI. And we see that there's a significant incidence of diabetes in South Asians and in Asians in general with what we call normal BMI or low BMI diabetes. And my practice, in my practice, I have taken um, South Asians with a BMI of you know, 22.7, which would be considered to be a normal BMI, down to a BMI of 21, and the diabetes goes away. So take home message is the normal body mass index for a South Asian is a BMI less than 23. You want to know what your BMI is? You search BMI online and multiple images come up and you can actually put your height, put your weight and I'll tell you what your BMI is. Great, thank you. Um, and you know, uh, uh, it was interesting that we heard a talk from Dr. Uh, Kanaya at UCSF uh, with the Masala study, uh, who has been studying on South Asians uh, uh, specifically. And, uh, and her uh, numbers kind of and stats show, uh, research shows that, um, you know, even at BMIs as low as 19.6, uh, you know, you can start seeing the metabolic differences uh, appearing in South Asians. So compared to the general population. Uh, so that's uh, very telling about BMIs. Uh, but I also wanted to let you know that Dr. Mamina mentioned one thing about being fit. And uh, being fit trumps everything. And uh, literally there was another research study uh, that was circulated just recently, which showed that, you know, compared to BMI, just looking at being physically fit and looking at things to do to being physically fit is just, you know, walking fast or, um, uh, you know, being able to do a push up or, or all indicators of being fit uh, can be very uh, advantageous, uh, you know, in terms of uh, looking at your continuous work. So thank you, uh, Dr. Molina. The other question that I wanted to say that because we have not covered it as much, but I wanted to make sure that this audience uh, had your wisdom around what single test that we can do right now that will help us diagnose coronary artery disease? And can you tell us a little bit more about that? So, you know, that is actually a very good question, which is, and that is that, you know, when we go to our physician, we go to our physician with a question. And the question is, am I okay? That's for a regular preventive care visit. Uh, unless you're having a toothache or you're having an arm ache or, or chest pain, question is, am I okay? And we do, many times we'll do us about it, you know, take your blood pressure, do a body or laboratory test. But none of those tests really can predict if you are at risk of a heart attack. And the predictive capacity of everything that we do is less than 22 to 26%. But today, you can get a heart scan, which is a CT scan of your heart. And if there's coronary artery calcification, then that, is the, that demonstrates that is diagnostic of coronary arteriosclerosis, which is the underlying reason why people have heart attacks. Without coronary arteriosclerosis, heart attacks do not happen. So you can go to the lab and you can see your bill of $1,000 for a Chem 18, CVC, urine, and lipid panel, maybe $1,200. $1, or you can go and get a heart scan for $158 and covered by insurance and see if you are really truly at risk for coronary artery events or not. Ashish, there are a few questions in the chat uh, just to bring your attention. Yes, and now looking at those. Um, so Dr. Molina, another question that has come up is that, has there been any studies done on South Asians when living in colder temperatures outside India and how diet changes and subsequent effect of climate and food is- Well, there have been multiple studies 
in uh, actually the first study that demonstrated the relationship between heart disease and salvations occurred in Singapore. Now that's not a cold, you know, a cold country area, uh, but the same the, the other studies happen in Canada and the United Kingdom, which you know have the four seasons. Uh, and actually, you know, India also has a cold part. Um, there is within India a place where you can freeze 12 months of the year. So um, the fact is that there is incidence of coronary artery disease in rural India, urban India, and out of India, and it all seems to be very similar. So I, I don't believe that the climate change can explain uh, some of the cardiovascular disease. Now there is a diet change um, between rural India and urban area in India and industrialized world. Um, there is more fast food in the industrialized uh, world um, there, but sometimes the quality of the vegetables may be less in rural India. Uh, because it's mainly, you know, it depends on where you are, either you have a rice-based diet or you have a wheat-based diet. Um, but to answer your question, um, I haven't seen the question as you ask being asked um, uh, that way. But I can tell you that the, both the incidence of diabetes and coronary artery disease has been shown in uh, temperate climates, cold climates, and warm climates. Another question that's come up is, uh, what is the impact of low vitamin D levels on heart disease in South Asians? Well, you know, I don't know in South Asians, but I know that vitamin D um, is, actually, I know that vitamin D deficiency is very common in South Asians. I know from my practice that vitamin D in my practice is associated with glucose dysmetabolism and the replenishment of vitamin D in individuals with glucose dysmetabolism or prediabetes at times can have a very significant benefit in glucose metabolism or how we dispose of sugar. There's a relationship between low vitamin D also and hypertension and the mechanisms by which that has been, that happens has been worked out and has to, to do with a hormone called parathyroid hormone that increases the risk for high blood pressure. The, the, uh, works, the working around for this metabolism and vitamin D, I have not seen, um, but South Asians be having a darker skin tend to have need more sunlight to produce vitamin D than fair skin individuals, number one. Number two, if you're looking at individuals, at least in Silicon Valley, where most of the work by South Asians is done in the computer industry or in the office industry, <coughs> then you have less, uh, less sun exposure. And lastly, there's this idea about um, uh, lactose intolerance and therefore <laughs> there's less, less consumption of um, vitamin D fortified milk, which is a very common source of vitamin D uh, uh, in our diet. All right, a couple more questions on uh, heart disease. Is heart disease mild arteriosclerosis reversible using meds? Should you be aiming to reverse a CT score once it becomes positive? Can you? So the calcium score tends to be fixed, even though there are reported cases of the calcium disappearing from the coronary arteries. Uh, it really, it represents inflammation and the results of inflammation. And it does represent the position of small bone particles within your uh, plaque. So that tends not to go away, uh, but we can stabilize plaque. And some studies have shown that with the vigorous lifestyle changes and pharmacotherapy in those days, very poor pharmacotherapy uh, this uh, was actually, there was a reversal of coronary artery stenosis. Uh, the game plan really uh, of all therapies is to prevent plaque, prevent new plaque or stabilize plaque because most of the time the plaque, which is the 
inflammatory process or arteriosclerotic process in the coronary artery is not obstructive. That's why most people with coronary artery disease are really The, uh, in the 1980s, uh, using um, uh, uh, vigorous dietary changes, uh, you know, like the Dean Ornish diet with a 10% fat diet, did demonstrate reversal of ischemia. And the Dean Ornish diet or program included also meditation and exercise, other than the diet. People have thought that it's just a diet, but it's a full program of meditation, exercise, and diet. A uh, quick question on BMI. Um, is there any difference in the BMI uh, thresholds for men and women? Um, well, there's actually, there are differences in the threshold of abdominal obesity uh, or waist circumference, uh, but there are not, um, uh, there are really not significant difference between the two. All right. Um, one question on calcium scoring that has come up is uh, calcium scoring isn't deemed as accurate a predictor of coronary uh, disease in South Asians as others. Is that true? And if so, why is that? Can, actually, Achish, I just got a text message uh, from the office. Can you, can you repeat the, call, the question again? The calcium scoring isn't deemed as accurate a predictor in South Asians as others. Well, true? actually, so um, the, the Masala trial um, was an add-on trial rep replicating the MESA trial, which did not include many South Asians. And in South Asian, particularly men, uh, they track the same, uh, the same curve as white, uh, at white males. Um, uh, South Asian females um, do not follow that same, that same line, but it's very similar. So we can actually, uh, you know, we can say that it does. Now, one thing is that South Asians tend to have heart attacks at a younger age, and you see less calcification at a younger age than at a later age. And what happens is that it's the soft non-calcified plaque that ruptures in anybody either South Asian or non-South Asian. All right, so um, that was all of the questions so far, but you know, uh, we are here for a few more minutes. I'm going to uh, just um, share my screen to show you. Ashish, there's one more question I right. see, um, if I may pose it. Surely. Can you comment on vegetarian lifestyles, especially those who do not eat fish? And what substitutes do you recommend? Okay, so you know that is a good question, and there are there are different men, there are different vegetarian uh, uh, diets. So when I went to medical school in the 1970s, I got one lecture on lifestyle at Yale, and it was a professor from Harvard by the name of Dr. Fawcett, who came down to give us a lecture on Seven Day Adventist who are actually, it's a religion that is male, is vegetarian. And the Seventh-day Adventists have a significant reduction in cardiovascular disease. And Loma Linda, which is actually where they are mainly based, is considered to be one of the blue zones. They're associated with increased um, longevity. Um, so the assumption is that vegetarian lifestyle is associated with improved health. Now, the problem, and then the question is, well, why South Asians? There's so many vegetarians in India and in South Asians. The problem is that there are vegetable eating vegetarians, and then there are grain eating vegetarians. And the South Asian diet tends to be mainly a grain based vegetarian diet. If you eat French fries and a Diet Coke, you're having a vegetarian meal, but you're not having a life promoting, health promoting meal. You're having the opposite. So if you're, having, if you're a vegetable consuming vegetarian, 
you should expect to see the benefits outlined in this talk. If you are a grain-based vegetarian, you should not expect to see the benefits discussed in this talk. So Ashish, I need to go, but it was a pleasure to be with you. And um, um, uh, uh, let, let me know if there's any other questions. I Just can... one, one last question before you go, Dr. Molina. How do you assess risk reward of daily baby aspirin for at 45 years for prevention of CAN? So the way it goes is when you're doing something to prevent or to treat, it's always what is the reward? If you do not have coronary artery disease and you take an aspirin, you have no reward. You just have risk of bleeding from the aspirin. Now, if you have coronary artery disease, then the aspirin decreases your risk of heart attack by a third. So you have a reward, which is worth the risk. So the question is not the aspirin. The question is, do you have coronary artery disease? Are you a risk? And if you are a risk, then you get a benefit from a baby aspirin. If you are not a risk, you get no reward. You just get risk. All right. Well, thank you. You're welcome. And if you uh, need to go and get back to your office, thank you for your time. I'll just go over some questions and um, go over how people can join the program. Thank you then, bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Molina. You're welcome. All right, so I was just with you, uh, which is um, if, if um, and this is something that we have done with, um, uh, with participants throughout the United States uh, and also in, um, uh, in India and other countries. Uh, if you are interested in kind of working this program, this program is a year long program. And the reason for it to be a year long program is because it works specifically on lifestyle. And lifestyle is not something that can be managed or changed, you know, in a short period of time. Many, many studies have shown that, you know, weight loss programs, for example, um, there's a good uh, chance that you'll have good weight loss over the first 12 weeks, and then it comes all back. And that's because it's just hard to sustain that sort of lifestyle. So what, have, what we have done at the South Asian Art Center is number one, made that process a little bit easier by having somebody who's working with you for a full year, number one. Number two is working with you, knowing fully well what some of the barriers and challenges you have in kind of you know, looking at lifestyle modalities to bring into your life. And number three, we don't change uh, and this is what many people are afraid of, is that, you know, you come in and you change my diet and you take away all the foods that I really enjoy eating. And that is certainly not the case. Uh, you know, this whole thing is about making it work with what you eat and making it work with the pantry that you currently have, not replacing it. So those are things that we've kind of incorporated in our curriculum and in our coaching methodology. So... Uh, so that's kind of what, what we do for the full year with you. And, uh, um, and the Aim to Prevent program is very easy to sign up. You just go to our website, southasianartcenter.org. If you do sign up, um, as you go through the form to kind of fill out your details, please do make a note um, that, you know, your referral has come from a partner, which is Satish, your friend um, here, who has been working very hard with me to bring this message to everybody out there. Uh, so do mention that as a referral, that we will know uh, where you're coming from and um, it will help us kind of guide the rest of the process uh, with you. Uh, what you get for in the program is a very comprehensive assessment, both done you know, on a, on a, on a telehealth way over the phone to, risk, uh, to gauge you know, your risk, but also through laboratory um, assessment and biometrics, which we usually get done through your physician's office. Uh, we review all of these assessments and evaluations and come up with our own risk and recommendations uh, report uh, and, and review that with you and then start building up a plan uh, that you want to actually implement 
over that period of uh, time. We'll provide you dietary consults if ne necessary. We'll also provide workshops very much like the kind that Dr. Molina gave. He kind of did a summary of all the four workshops that we normally do, but you'll get a good hour and more detail and more science around each of these modalities and why it makes sense and how you could incorporate it with tips and tricks, um, you know, easily into your lifestyle. And then the coach works with you for a full 12 months, connecting once a month with you uh, for, for uh, goals that you want to set yourself uh, up with uh, during this time and having some sustainable change. And, you know, of course, Satish uh, is currently going through the program and he's kind of connected four or five times with the coach. So that's kind of when he thought, um, you know, that he wants, wanted to kind of get this awareness out. He's been working with me for several months now uh, to see how this message can be spread out and that we can be effective in bringing this pro program to a lot of your friends and family in the New York, New Jersey, and the East Coast area. So that's, um, you know, how you would sign up for the program. And then this week is also Giving Week. Um, so I just wanted to say that um, uh, we are using that opportunity to, um, to ask um, individuals and donors. We are a nonprofit organization. This year, we've not had a fundraising gala, which we normally do uh, to raise funds, but we have gone back to our major supporters and they have been very kind to put together what's, what we call the challenge pool. Uh, and they have put in 75K uh, into that pool already. And uh, we are now going out to others and donors and supporters and friends of family and, um, and our participants and asking them to um, you know, match the challenge pool. So if um, that is of interest um, to you and um, you feel that you could participate in the spirit of um, Giving Week and Giving Tuesday, which is today, um, you could contact me and I'll walk you through how that needs to be done. Uh, Satish is also going to send you another email after this, which um, I'll, I'll uh, give him a link to the presentation. And if I'm able to successfully load the video of this presentation, a link to that as well. So he can forward it on to you um, as he reaches out to you uh, beyond this um, meeting. So any questions, any thoughts, any uh, feedback as we end the call today? Ashish, if I may just uh, leg in with, uh you know, as we get to the 6.30 and cross that time. Um, being on the program um, has certainly uh, helped me substantially. And uh, just for everybody who's listening uh, still on the call is I have supplemented uh, to monitor metrics on my heart rate, uh, the benefits of lowering arresting heart rate of uh, meditation, um, have all uh, massively uh, turned uh, just in the last six to eight months. And these are all metrics that, whether it is my trainers or whether it is fitness or whether it is uh, you know, medically endorsed metrics. So I've certainly seen the benefits of this and only uh, the, my attachment to the South Asian Heart Center as a nonprofit is that it also is a nonprofit that serves to our benefit. And so just to underscore uh, participation in the program and giving uh, to, to this benefit where we stand to benefit from, benefit from is materially a different ask from all the other uh, asks that I get from other nonprofits. So with that, I'd like to close at least my comments. Uh, thank everybody for uh, joining today on Giving Tuesday and uh, to continue to spread the word. Uh, I will follow up with an email to share as much of the materials and links uh, once I receive them from Ashish. But uh, the ask is to really to engage and that comes in various ways that I've already spoken of. Thank you Satish also for the opportunity to uh, present to everybody here. Thank you everybody. All right, bye-bye.